Hey everybody, I'm John Siskovich, and today we're gonna go over baby chicks in the brooder. We, on one of the last videos, we talked about before you get baby chicks, what do you wanna do, what do you wanna prepare for, what are some of the principles that you're gonna follow, and the methods are gonna be different for everybody. Now we've received baby chicks, and I have a bunch of pictures of a batch of 240 birds, uh, broiler chickens, it's the same for egg layer chicks, it's the same for broiler chicks, all the brooder concepts are relatively simple, and straightforward um, and similar if you're raising chickens for meat or for eggs. But as the name of this video says, because I have to just play it up for YouTube, after you get baby chicks, do this. All right, so I love this picture so much just because this backlit chick right here is contemplating the salad bar that I brought in, but we're gonna get to that in a second. So let me go to my photos here. In the brooder when I start, you guys will recognize this from the other video. I have my tracking sheet up here. I have my scale for weighing birds. I have extra feeders and waters prepared, cleaned, ready to go. Uh, I have a bag of feed. Sometimes I have a feed drum or bucket in there. The bag just, it worked out in this scenario. Uh, and I have two lamps. It's a warmer time of year. There's no straightforward, like this many, this many lights for this amount of birds. These are uninsulated walls. It's not like an insulated garage on a cold concrete slab. Uh, it is a wood bottom with wood sides on just framed in two by threes, two by fours. And it's, uh, it can be a chillier place. So in the summer, I use less lights, fewer lights. And in the winter, I use more lights if I know it's gonna be really cold. So it's not one light for X amount of chicks, it's more lights in colder times and fewer lights in warmer times. What you want is to balance your heat that you're providing, the relative humidity, humidity in the atmosphere, and how cold and dramatic the swings can be uh, based off the type of shelter that you have for your brooder. So this is the methods are, or the principles are few, the methods are many. So in the beginning, I push the birds into a smaller area using this divider here. And this is not tacked down to the ground. It just has these legs and then a little lip on the bottom. We know that I have rounded edges. Those rounded edges continue on this temporary wall. And that temporary wall comes out and you can see I have the rest of the brooder all prepared so that when, oh look at they're so cute and fuzzy and warm. Ah, so when I expand it, now I'm out to the entire area and I've got my curved walls everywhere. Even though these birds are getting bigger as they you know grow up a little bit, my heat sources are over here, my feed and water are over here. I've got a nice even distribution. This is just after I fed out so all the birds are chowing down. Um, a good distribution of birds and yeah, that's, that's the brooder setup. So just to dig into some of this uh, from a different angle, I have my lights on. I have some of these lights off because it's warming and the birds are getting older. I'm starting to harden them off for going outside. Uh, I have my feed and water spread out so not everything is clumped together. Uh, they have a warm area where they can nestle in over here. Some of these birds are just running away from me because I'm a human, I'm causing a disturbance in the brooder and I'm taking a picture. So you have to be aware of the effect that you have on your birds to get them more used to you. There's only one thing you can do and that's spend time with your birds. And if you're spending time in there to linger graze, noticing the small things, how they affect the big things, noticing chicken behavior, then you're gonna see how the birds behave and what adjustments you're gonna need to make to your management strategy. So I've got some trough feeders. I've got a larger capacity feeder just in case these run low. I have backup where I can hold more pounds of feed. Um, I have two types of water in here where this is a nipple drinker bucket, which is what I typically use in the field. Uh, and you wanna start them in the brooder with what you're gonna use in the field so there's not a learning curve. There's already gonna be a learning curve when you transition them from the brooder to the field. So you wanna lessen that by giving them the type of feeders. I use trough feeders and I use nipple drinkers uh, in the brooder that you're gonna have out in the field. But for added capacity, uh, I also have this bell water here with a, um, what is that? It's like the water heater tray that you would put in your house uh, just to collect any water. These have been getting old and leaking on us, so we've been 
finding creative ways to like get one more year out of it. Really, I need to replace my waterers. And then this is just a bell waterer bottom that I filled with grit and it's a free choice grit feeder because you want to start giving them grit in the brooder so that they can digest and chew and process their food better. They're growing, they're putting on weight. That's what we want. And we want them to get big and fat and happy so that then we can kill them and eat them. Um, so the various different elements, we're going to go over bedding, we're going to go over grit. So, uh, we're going to go over what are the, what are the fundamentals of a uh, good brooding situation, environment, feed, water, air, and I think that covers it all. The four elements, I may make a separate video of the four elements of good brooding. Um, so here we have environment, you know, our curved edges, our warm spot, our cool spots. So the birds can self-regulate. Uh, we have feed, we have water, we have grit, all these things. Fantastic. And then what you can't see in this picture is that I have various windows and ways to create airflow without having drafts. There's two ways to do grit as we're talking about grit, just because it's my next photo. You can do an open free choice feeder where you have just grit and the birds have to say, that is food, that is grit. I'm going to eat that and then I'm going to eat that. You have to make a choice. You can also put it right into their feed. So these little dots right here, uh, I will put out a trough feeder and I will put the grit right on top of it. If the birds don't want it, they will eat around it. If they do want it, they will crush it. And it's the best way to see if your birds need grit or if they don't need grit is to top dress the feed because either they'll slam that grit or at the bottom of it. So I'll feed out on the trough. The birds will eat the trough all the way down to the bottom. And how I know I need to put more grit in is that when I get there, there's no grit left in that feeder at all. If I've been feeding grit out for a couple days and the birds are like, yo, we're good. There's enough rocks in our food. Uh, there'll be grit left in the bottom of that trough feeder. So I'll either feed less or I'll skip it for a day or two. Let them work that through their system and then I'll keep feeding it out and use the birds as my tell for when I need to manage that. Um, this one, I just love this picture because it's like this warm, cozy, fluffy, undulating wave of wonderful broilerness where in the very beginning, if we see these, my feeder and water are close to my lights so that the birds have access really close to where it's warm. The lights are passively warming up the water to broiler to brooder temperature, uh, temperature of the water, uh, has a big, plays a big factor. And we'll go into this in another video of how well your birds do, but we want to see our birds eating, snuggling, drinking all very comfortably. And as they get bigger, we're going to move our feeders and waters away from that warm spot. So they have to walk out to them and then come back in. They're starting to harden off. They're getting some exercise. We know that dark meat comes from a movement and uh, blood flow. So we want to get our birds moving, get the kickstart that metabolism. Unlike a barn setting where we're going to want to minimize movement to maximize growth. We want our birds to be a little healthier um, because they're preparing for life out on pasture. Now we've done grit. We've done snuggles. This is a big one and this is fun and this is a terrible photograph, but in my brooder, I always have extra bedding material. And if you get little wet spots, you can top dress it and cover up that manure and the nitrogen and the manure and the carbon of your bedding material will work together to minimize ammonia, bad smells, uh, wet spots, things that the birds don't want. Or if you have a water that leaks and the bedding gets really wet, you can use your extra bedding, which you have on hand. You have backup bedding. Even if you don't use it for another year, uh, having reserves is a great thing because you can take that wet bedding out and put that dry bedding in. Why is that important? Well, the way that chickens breathe, they have in their trachea little cilia, uh, just like in your ear, like the little things that capture sound. Those little cilia are capturing dust particles, which may contain fungus or mold or viral spores or whatever. I don't know if viruses come in spores. It's like mold, fungal spores or virus, virus cells. Um, and we don't want fungus, mold, viruses, bacteria to build up in their bedding because then they, those cilia will capture it. It'll create more mucus. The birds will sneeze. They'll sneeze as they go to take a drink. They'll spread it into their waters. It'll spread throughout the flock. And then you will have sick birds that you could have not had that sickness, that illness or pathogen in your brooder by just simply having 
drier bedding. You want dry, fluffy, nice bedding. You don't want a wet manure pack, especially these broiler chickens just poop like machines. And uh, you'll see around the feeders, they stand here and poop, stand here and poop, stand here and poop. And you will can scoop that out. You can move your feeders around. Uh, and then when you move the feeder, top dress with a little bit of bedding, and it helps keep a dry, nice, fluffy atmosphere so you don't have that buildup for your birds so that they don't get mucus, they don't get uh, lesions or burns or ammonia sickness. Uh, you don't get coccidiosis, all these things that can happen. Little things that if you're new to this, don't worry, what you have to take away from this is that dry fluffy bedding, if you wouldn't put your hand down in it or sit in it to uh, comfortably hang out with your birds, then the birds don't wanna live in it. If you smell ammonia, we detect as humans ammonia at much higher levels than birds do. They're sensitive to it as much lower levels uh, where humans can't even detect it yet. So if you're smelling ammonia and you'll know because you'll walk in and you'll be like, stank in here, then they are suffering. So fresh, fresh bedding. And I keep a bucket or a thing uh, that I can scoop and sprinkle, distribute, just like you're putting powdered sugar on a donut because donuts, mm, delicious. Feeders. I have a several different types of feeders. Uh, I included this photo, photo because look at all these fuzzy chicken butts. We got one here that is showing signs of pasty butt and pasty butt in older birds. These birds are pretty young because they only have a few little fight, flight feathers here. This pasty butt, not super build up. It may just be a fresh turd, but it's something that as I'm linger grazing, I have 240 bird, bird butts to watch. I wanna watch, are all my birds doing it? Is it one bird? Do I have to take that one bird out? Because what pasty butt is, is that when they're starting to poop uh, and it comes out, it'll clog up their vent, that backside, and then they can't poop, it's a butt plug, and it won't come out and they'll go septic and they'll die, it's terrible. And to treat that, uh, we won't go into it in detail in this video, uh, but if you're gonna save this bird, if you notice that clump, you bring it out, hold it very carefully, you, you grasp the air around a, a bird, uh, just like you're harvesting herbs, you don't crush them with your hand, you hold the air around them and they can move, but there's not a lot of space for them to move. And then you have warm water and you run the warm water over their butt and you just break up that little poop clump with your fingernail and then later on you get to like, just fish out the poop from under your fingernail, um, however you decide to do it. Um, with these feeders, as the birds grow, putting something on top, because then this bird has been walking around in the litter, has been getting poop and pathogens on its potential pathogens on its feet, and now is walking in everybody's food source. So we're gonna wanna put a lid on it. We're gonna wanna raise these up so the birds don't have to dip down as far. Um, and get this guy out of there. He can also sit there, eat, and poop. You can almost watch the entire digestive cycle happen where the bird is eating and pooping in the feed. It's not a good scene. It's not what we want to do. Water. We want clean water. We want clean, healthy water. If I can raise this up, this should be a little bit higher. We want to go about level with the back of the chicken, like right here. And these I clean out every day. Uh, Jeff Maddox has in his Feeding Pasture Poultry book, if you won't drink out of the water, the birds don't want to drink out of the water. They want it to not have any biofilms. They don't want it to have off flavors. They don't want stale or stagnant water that's been there for a long time. Uh, you want to keep that water fresh. And what we're doing is noticing all these little tiny things, how they affect the big things, our production, our health, our farm, our bottom line, our finances, our mortgage, all starts with cleaning the waterers out. That's linger grazing, a little thing that affects the big things. We're optimizing for the happiness of the chicken and making sure that the little elements are happy and healthy and functioning properly so that our birds are productive so that we can make a living on farming. Now on the outside of my brooder, and I, I chose this picture for the nipple drinkers here, I transitioned from the bell waters when they're young. See, only primary flight feathers here, fuzzy yellow bird, wonderful backlight. I've got this guy sleepy behind him. This is a good picture that I can use for marketing because I can put text here. I can put text right here or along the bottom in an L shape and get that happy bird thing to say, new baby chicks on farm. You can sign up for our chicken CSA. I have an annex outside where the birds have a trap door that they can go out and get some fresh grass. I have feeders outside to encourage them. We notice now that they're feathered out on their bellies around their wings. Their heads are still a little bit fuzzy, but they're already getting uh, feathers around their earlobes. 
and I'm transitioning them over to these uh, buckets where we want a decent angle where they don't have to reach too far because I raise straight run birds and the males and the females are differing sizes. So if it's a real big stretch for a male, it's going to be impossible for a female to reach. And those birds are getting used to the drinkers that this is a chicken tractor, a Siskovich all-purpose chicken tractor. They're already getting used to life in here in the brooder so that when we move them to the field, they're like, oh, we're like just outside all the time now. And that's great. And we can see Kentucky bluegrass. I've got some dandelion over here. I think I've got some clover over in this far corner. Uh, and I know there's plantain in here, some right down here. That's actually wild mustard. So I've got a little bit of biodiversity happening. If I kept the birds in here, this would be gone. That's why we brood in batches and let this rest and start them inside and then gradually let them outside. And then once they're in chicken tractors full time, we move them every day to maintain that vegetation biodiversity and spread their nitrogenous or nitrogen rich manure uh, around the farm to feed the grass, to feed the soil, to feed the microbes, feed the microbes, to feed the soil, to feed the grass, to feed the chickens, to feed the people, to feed the planet. And then um, if you don't have an annex outside or if you're doing this in your garage, you can't let them run, but you have some space. What I do is put a, a hanging basket of some sort and I've got clover in here. I've got mustard. I've got plantain. I've got grass, a lot of clover, nitrogen rich. Uh, chickens prefer broad leaves because they can peck and snap it versus a long fibrous like a fescue. They're not really in love with. And uh, here's a banana for scale. Uh, that's how big our birds are right now. It's a banana size. This is that banana. You get an idea for how big the birds are. Uh, I got my feeder, got my birds. This is actually a pile of dirt. I'll take the grass and the clippings, put it in here, take a shovel full of dirt uh, to supplement their grit. They're getting the microbes from out in my farm. They're getting used to it and adjusting in their digestive tract while they have a comfortable setting. Everything in the brooder is to prepare them for success in the field. And here we go back to our initial picture. We got seed heads. This is plantain. Um, this is clover. And that bird is just like salad bar, man. Let's go. I love it. And then uh, this guy, you know, that nice, good stretch backlight, light off in the background, uh, light hitting and creating hard edges on the salad bar. And then I've got room for text here for my farm marketing. I got room for text here. Or I can simply just share this and say, our, we believe in pasture poultry so much that when the birds are in the brooder and they're, they're fragile little babies, we bring the pasture to them. And once they harden off and they look like this, we bring them out to the pasture and let them poop where poop belongs. And that is spread out in an even amount, feeding the soil, which is feeding the grass, which is going through photosynthesis and capturing carbon from the atmosphere, helping to save the planet one chicken tractor move at a time. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. I'm going to start to do videos where I let the videos up for a week and then I sit back and read the comments and respond to you guys. So if you get comments in the first week, I'm going to start to respond to them on video. And for now, like, let's go back here. Magic. Enjoy this. That is the, the most important part. That's what linger grazing gives you is you watch all these things. You watch YouTube and you're linger grazing on YouTube. You're noticing the little details that I have. Now you're going to go out, you're going to order your chicks, you're going to start raising birds this year. You're going to be worried and you're going to put the feeders at different heights and the water is at different heights and is your water clean enough and is your bedding okay? And if you can't bring kids in there because it's so gross, it's too gross for the birds. I have a two-year-old and an eight-year-old. I bring my daughters in there my two-year-old touches everything and then puts her hand in her mouth still. It's a thing. So we want to have a clean, conducive environment for our birds, our customers, our family, for us to enjoy it. If you're optimizing for happiness, everybody wins. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. You guys are amazing. I want to hear all about you guys raising chickens. If you're raising chickens in Siskovich chicken tractors, send me an email. Hello at farmmarketingsolutions.com. I'm John Siskovich. Until next time, I'll see you out in the field. <laughs> all right, we're done. Banana for scale!